morning, church. Come on, how many came ready to worship the Lord in this place? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Come on.
Something has to break. Something has to break.
us to be right here, right now, Jesus. Summon us to be right here. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. So we're not just singing this. We're declaring that the chains are broken in this place. So right now, I just want you to lift up your hands, both of you. And I want you to close them like you're holding your chains in your hands right now. 
And as we begin to declare that the chains are falling, I want you to believe it and declare it over yourself right now that whatever may be on your heart, whatever may be on your mind, whatever you may have struggled with this week, it's time to let it go. It's time to break it in the name of Jesus. And I hear the chains fall. your life. And I hear the chains falling. Yeah. I hear the chains falling. I hear the chains falling. Oh, I hear the chains falling. Father, we thank you in this place. Father, we thank you that all around this room, things are being broken in lives today. Father, we thank you that as we stand here today, you are restoring everything that you can do. Father, there's nothing that you can't conquer in this place today. So, Father, we lift up your name. We lift up your glo the glory to you, Father. We lift up our praise. Whatever may be on our hearts, God, we are declaring in the name of Jesus it's broken. And Father, we're asking that you would renew our cups. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your anointing, with your power, with your joy, with your peace, Father. The peace that only you can give, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Te adoramos, Señor. Te adoramos, chains are broken in this house today and then you may be seated hey everyone it's david hill I want to take a second to let you know how stoked we are that you are worshiping with us today at Family Life Church. Our mission is to connect people to life. No matter what you came in here with today, I believe that God has a promise of life for you. But a couple of things first. If you're a first time guest, could you do us a favor and fill out a connect card? There's one located in the back of every seat. And after service, you could bring it to our next step table by where the front doors are and we will have a gift waiting for you. 
Secondly, we believe that God has created you on purpose and for a purpose. We want to help you walk out that purpose by serving others. So if you're ready to take your next step by joining the team and to start serving, we want to invite you to attend Connect Point. It's a 45-minute class we do once a month to help people learn more about who we are as the church and how you can plug into the ministries here and start to make a difference. You can start by signing up at the Next Steps table by the front doors, or you can go to our church website, ocalafc.com. In my experience, church is so much more fulfilling when you get off the bench and get onto the field. We like to say around here that those who serve, they get the best seat in the house. Lastly, I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Every dollar is crucial in helping us accomplish our mission. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches us, don't store up treasures on earth, but store them up in heaven. In essence, what Jesus is telling us is that we need to use what God has blessed us with to strategically and joyfully invest our resources for eternity. In other words, the only thing that we can take to heaven with us are other people. You can partner with us financially by going to ocalaflc.com and clicking on the giving link or by dropping physical checks and cash into the Dropbox, which is located just outside the auditorium door on the wall. We like to say, because God gave all, we can be boldly generous. Anyways, church, let's get ready for today and let's open up our hearts and minds and let's expect God to do something special. Good morning. My name is Charles Hill, and I'm the founding pastor of Family Life Church, and we're certainly delighted to see each of you here today, and I'm going to call you my fellow hurricane survivors. Woke up Friday morning, went out in the yard. There was about a 30-foot limb, about so big, laying in my yard. And I remember looking at it and saying, I need to go to Chick-fil-A and get something to eat. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and uh, on the way back home, this friend of mine called and said, I'm on the way to your house with a chainsaw. And I said, no, you don't have to worry about that. I, I, I can take care of it. I've got a little electric chainsaw. He said, uh, how long is it going to be before you get back to your house? I, not a few minutes. He said, I'll be waiting at your house for you. So he cut up the whole thing for me. Then my son David came over, and we have a five-by-six trailer, about six loads of that carried to the back of the property. We burned it. It's all gone. I'm just uh, really, really thankful, um, my fellow hurricane survivors. Amen. I'd like to invite you to read with me as I read our faith declaration. God's grace empowers me to live for Jesus. His word is at work in my heart to bring me into his fullness. I am fully committed to his plan for my life, and I submit to his leadership and authority over me. Jesus is my Lord. The Holy Spirit goes before me and leads my steps. I do not belong to myself. I belong to the King of kings and Lord of lords. By his hand of mercy, I now stand and walk in his light. I am cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and am a child of the living God. Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord some praise for that. Today is the fourth and our last in this series that we're calling Winning the War in Your Mind. You know, Scripture is really filled with a lot of references to the human brain, the human mind. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. This is in your notes. Paul said, Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you. The Greek word is suke. We get our modern word psychology, you know, the study of the mind. From that word, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So what was the mind that Jesus had that we're to have this mind in? 
the mind of humility and obedience. Humbling ourselves before God and just looking to Him. Humility. I can remember when I got saved, I just, it's so real to me now. Every Sunday before I get up to speak, I'm caught up with memories of when I got saved and I humbled myself before God and God came in and infused joy and purpose into my life. Let this mind, the letting is up to us. We're the ones that has to do the letting. The letting is also, listen to this, it's determined by focus, okay? That begs the question, what are we focused on? All right? For instance, instead of focusing on your disappointments, sing a song of praise. You go out and get ready to go to work in the morning and have two flat tires. You're not wanting to sing a song of praise, are you? Sing a song of praise. Instead of focusing on the hurt you feel, you know, life has situations that hurt. You know, people that don't really mean to hurt often, they will hurt and you'll come out, you know, hurting. Instead of focusing on that, sing a song of worship to our redeeming God. Instead of focusing on that missed opportunity, lift your hands in praise to the God who watches over you. Listen to some worship music. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. The Bible says that we are composed of spirit, soul, and body. Okay? The functions of the spirit, conscience, revelation. We receive revelation from God through our spirit. And we fellowship God through our spirit. That's the functions of the spirit. The soul, the functions of the soul is for intellect. We minister to the intellect through teaching. The, the next part of the soul is the, uh, the, the emotions. How do you minister to emotions? Music. And if you're really strung out emotionally and you need some heavy-duty stuff, listen to some duets or a trio. Good uh, harmony. It does something to the emotions. When I was a senior in high school, I, I actually did very well in high school. And I, I was scared silly that I might be the salutatorian. That would mean I would have to speak in front of the whole school, the town. And I had a, stat, a stammering, stuttering, stammering problem. And it just horrified me, the idea of getting up in front of them. So all I had to do was be number two in the class. And I knew I was right there at that. Fortunately, I was only number four. Now, I go tell people I graduated number four in my class. And see, they graduated with a class of 700. You see where I'm going with this? They think they're talking to a pretty sharp cookie here. I didn't graduate in the top 10% of my class. We, uh, <laughs> But quite a bit of stress my senior year. A lot of stuff they had to deal with. And uh, I can remember washing dishes for my mom at the end of one of the days. And uh, I put on a, an album that had harmony, beautiful harmonies. And by the time I finished washing the dishes, listening to that harmony, all that stress seemed to all just settle down and go. So uh, your soul has intellect, emotions. You minister the emotions through music. How do you minister to the third part of the soul, which is the willpower? I think you know there's a lot of us that we know what we need to do, but the follow-through is a little bit weak. Knowing what you need to do is one thing. Carrying it out is another. So how do you minister to the will? Through fellowship. We have groups on Tuesday nights and really other nights in the week as well that uh, we come together and we, we study the Bible and we fellowship. On Tuesday nights, we have a fantastic layout of food. People bring stuff, cover dish, and we get some magnificent stuff in here. And, uh, but the fellowship is very important. Be in fellowship because it will minister to and strengthen your soul so that uh, hopefully you'll be able to not just know what you need to do, but follow through and actually do it. 
uh, when we launched Family Life Church, I sent out over 12,000 brochures, flyers. And I was told beforehand, don't expect a big response. I mean, 12,000 is a lot. I mean, you know what happens when you get these flyers in the mail. Trash can, trash can, uh, trash can, trash can. And so I was hoping more than two families. <laughs> we had two families respond from the brochure. But there was another family that were friends of ours that surprised us and showed up. They wanted to be part of this new church fellowship, new work. And so we were very excited. They were a family that was very devoted to God. Matter of fact, both of them were graduates of Oral Roberts University. They were faith people. They loved God. Their, their family was just really centered in the Lord. So I, I was just thrilled that they could be with us. And so over the next few months, we, we, we saw close to no growth. It was just showing up, having church. That was good. And I had all my four kids there. That was the the delight of my heart, you know, my family. You know how that is. But uh, about the fifth, maybe sixth month, he came to me. He said, we are going to move on and find another church. What do you think that did to me? Kabam. <sighs> what can you do? We can't do anything. You know, you got to accept, you know, people want to move on. And so God did something that totally surprised me. He poured, it's just like he stepped into my brain, into my mind, and took over. Have you ever heard this song that goes like this? I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day of my life, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning, when I lay my head at rest, I am blessed. I am blessed. And God took over. And he, he didn't really force me to sing it. It's just that song kept going over and over in my mind and in my thoughts. I couldn't stop singing it. And this went on for like 48 hours. I, I went to bed. Instead of laying there and fretting, you know, about regret losing this very special family we love so much, all I could say was, I'm blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. I just sang it. Went to sleep, woke up next morning, guess what, singing it. Went to school, and I was a middle school teacher. I needed that song. I am blessed all through the day. I sang that song over and over and into the third day. And let me tell you what, I walked through that situation marvelously. Um, in your notes, our emotions feed off our thoughts. Our emotions feed off of our thoughts. Look at this. Philippians. Again, you should see this in your notes. Philippians 4 and 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. All right. Always. When is always? See, there is no time that doesn't include always, right? Rejoice always. Here you are sitting in traffic. You're in the turn lane and the guy in front of you, you know, he's only got about 20 seconds. He got to get through the light because it changes and he's on his social media. Come on, dude. We need, I'm in a hurry. And he finally recognizes. So he hits the gas and goes through the yellow light and here I am. Ranks are rot. Okay, rejoice in the Lord always. Woke up Friday morning, I tell you about the limb that was in my yard. Rejoice in the Lord always. Go down to Chick-fil-A and rejoice. <laughs> I will say it again, rejoice. See, it's either rejoice or not rejoice. It's up to us. If you want to win the war in your mind, start by rejoicing. Make rejoicing a part of who you are. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's enough you can rejoice right there apart from everything else. Rejoice that you have another day to get it right. You know how it is? You're not too satisfied with how you responded to this situation? You rejoice because you got another day to get it right. Maybe you should have said something, but you didn't. 
you got another day to get it right. Or maybe you said something that you wish you had not said. you got another day to get it right. Rejoice that you have breath in your lungs. Realize as long as you've got breath in your lungs, God is not finished with you. Rejoice that the God of heaven is on your side. He is for you. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you've not memorized that, I would encourage you to do that. Paul said in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be, look at this, transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. How are we transformed? The renewing of our minds. The way we think about things is extremely important. Philippians 4.6 says very succinctly, do not be anxious about anything. Anything. That's kind of like always. Do not be anxious about anything. You sit down to reconcile your bank statement. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. <laughs> we could have driven that older car a little bit longer. I just got myself in a pickle here. So do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, does that word always come back to you? In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Did you know, and I want you to think about this, that if it's in your mind, it's in God's heart. Think about that. If it's in your mind, it's in God's heart. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is powerful. Powerful enough to guard your mind and your heart. This is peace that is launched by prayer and petition. Why is it that some of us are reluctant to go to the Lord in prayer? a bunch of us will look at how we've done, maybe things we've said, things we failed to do, stuff like that stacks up, and we're kind of embarrassed to even go to the Lord. Well, how are we admonished in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16? It says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. God is not turning you away. Sure, you blew it over and over and over, but go to him with confidence anyway so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Don't listen to Satan's lie that God doesn't want to hear from you. God invites us to go to him in confidence, confidence that he welcomes and listens to us. Philippians 4, 8, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things and what's going to happen. And the God of peace will be with you. In your notes, your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Let that sink in. In this series, we've looked at the realities of Satan feeding us a lie and us believing it. You see, when we spend time in Scripture, spend time to go to church, sit under preaching from the Word of God, spending time fellowshipping uh, with other believers, all these things help us to recognize Satan's lies. And speaking of spending time with folks, uh, through the week, we have what's called life groups. If you've not joined a life group, 
You get a chance to sit around a small circle of people and y'all do, we do an, an expanded look and, and, and trying to understand what all God is speaking to us and exposing the lies of Satan. John chapter 10 verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. If we listen to Satan, he will feed us with lies. He'll try to kill, steal, and destroy your hope. Hope is so important. There was a gentleman by the name of Ed Rush. Ed, very bright gentleman, he flunked kindergarten. Yeah. He said, I wasn't aware you could flunk kindergarten. But he rose to the challenge. So he said that um, he was able to get through high school, went into the military. He wanted to be a top gun, a, a pilot. And he achieved that. He became one of the designated top guns in the military. And he would instruct others in how to fly these jets. So he did quite well, but he finished his military service, and then Ed became a businessman. And he said he did quite well. You know, he just proved to be quite adept in the business world. But then he ran into something that he wasn't anticipating. Very simply, he had began to have to deal with depression. I mean, doing well in business, money coming in, Money was an issue, and he didn't know where this depression was coming from. He was a sporadic church attender, didn't really believe that God spoke to you, but he'd go to church some. And so he asked his pastor of this church, he said, I think I need a counselor. So the pastor advised him, someone to go and talk to. And um, so he sat down with his counselor, and the counselor said, what I want you to do is to ask God what is the lie that you believe? And the guy said, okay, I picked the wrong counselor. I need somebody that knows, you know, psychology, not this. And so the counselor, Ed said, you know, he thought about leaving, just getting up and leaving. But he said, no, I paid for an hour, so I'm going to get my hour's worth. <laughs> so he, he closed his eyes and he asked God, what's the lie that I believe? And he said, to his utter shock, God spoke to him and told him, said, you believe that you are alone. And then in that moment, in his mind, he was transported back to when he was six years old. His parents had gone through a divorce. He said his parents are great people, but they were going through a very rough time. And he said in his mind, he saw that his mother was driving, he was in the back seat, and the daddy was outside the vehicle on the passenger side. And they were arguing about who was going to pay for the second year of kindergarten. Can you imagine that? And the mother, out of frustration, took a handful of papers that had to be completed, and she just threw them out the window. And drove off. He said that as a six-year-old, the first thing he did, he screamed at his mother and said, Stop! Which she did. Then he jumped out of the car and ran back there and started picking up those papers. And when he stood up, that's when the lie came to him. He said, I'm all alone. I'm all alone. The counselor said, you asked God to show you what the lie was. Now, I want you to ask God, what is the truth? Well, he was shocked that God actually spoke to him. So he said, let's go ahead and do this. So he said, God, what is the truth? And again, to his shock, God spoke to him. 
he showed him, and he went back to that car. And he said when he got out of the car, there was Jesus walking right next to him. And as he started picking up the papers, Jesus reached out and helped him. Went back to the car and he looked over and Jesus was sitting right next to him. Jesus had never left him for one moment. Ed, at that point, realized this thing called serving Jesus. God actually speaks if we'll take time to listen. Well, he, as I said, he was a successful businessman and Ed would be invited to go speak to certain conferences, business gatherings. And so this is what he started doing. These, this was secular. This was not church sponsor or anything like this. And uh, Ed would ask everybody. He, he would tell them, so first off, you need to find out the lie that you believe. And the way you're going to find out is you're going to ask God. <laughs> A secular business meeting. Well, there was this lady at one of the meetings and uh, she was one of these power attorneys. Very, very sharp lady. Lawyer. But she was an atheist. And she said, uh, I didn't come here for this. And she almost got up and walked out. But then her curiosity took over. Ladies, you know how that works? The curiosity. Wonder where this is going. So she didn't leave. But then he instructed him, ask God what lie you believe. Well, she didn't believe in God. But she said, okay, I'll speak to the God that's not there. So she said, okay, God, what lie have I believed about myself? She was just totally amazed as she heard God say to her, you believe you are ugly, unworthy, and I'm done with you. She was stunned because she knew that she had heard this voice speak. You see, she had never told anybody. When she was five years old, a family member had molested her sexually and continually molested her for several years. And the pain of that situation, she saw herself as nothing but dirty rags. That was the lie that she believed. Then he told everybody there, now you're going to ask God for the truth. Ask God to show you what the truth is. So that's what she did. Her name was Maya, and she heard God say, I love you, Maya. You are beautiful in my eyes, and I love you. She couldn't believe it. Could not believe that there was a God that was actually speaking to her. And as she began to exercise faith in the Lord, she felt the chains begin to fall from her life as she began to reach out to the God of heaven, her creator. Let me share something with you. You and I are designed to hear from God. God has put a homing signal in our hearts, but too often we don't take time to listen. Spending time in the Word of God, spending time in prayer, we're giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to speak to us. This lady... Dr. Carolyn Leaf wrote a book called Switch, Switch on Your Brain. She said, it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. When we pray, things change. And often it's us that do the changing. In your notes, worry is a sin of distrusting the promises and power of God. Listen to this, Romans 8 and 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about 
sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. I think all of you have studied a little bit at least. You're familiar with the Great Depression that took place in the 30s. When we get up to where we have 7 or 8% unemployment, is bad. During the Great Depression, it was 25% unemployment. And a whole bunch of mamas out there had two or three or more kids. And it was tough. And then she'd find out that she was pregnant. And these mothers too often would say, I don't need another mouth to feed. I don't want this baby. And she would say it over and over and over through her nine months of pregnancy. When that baby's born, she'll take that little guy and hold him and fall head over heels in love with that little baby. She will love that baby with the purest and deepest love you can imagine. But she'd already implanted a rejection complex within that young life. That lie would be firmly implanted into their thought system. You know where the point of release from that is? It's found in Romans 5.8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I have a confession I want all of us to say out loud. There's power in what we confess. If you could put up that confession for us. Say this with me. Jesus loves me so much he died for me. You see, when the lie of Satan comes along saying, nobody cares about me, share that with him. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. That is, in Christ, look at this, He chose us before the world was made so that we would be His holy people. People without blame before Him. Look at verse 5. Because of his love, God has already decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. This was what, look at this, he wanted and what pleased him. I want you to confess with me. You ready? God actually chose me. He actually wants me in spite of my past. It makes no difference. What happened yesterday? He loves you with an everlasting love. When Satan calls you a no, nobody, you share that with him. 1 Peter 2 9 says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Got another confession for you. You ready? God loves me because he called me out of darkness. If your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thought, do you like the direction your thoughts are taking you? If we're going to win the war in our minds, we've got to begin to think the truth of God's word. And we've got to say it with our mouths. I remember God was hammering that with me because I had developed quite a complaining. <laughs> Little mouth here to <laughs> complain. And God told me, he said, you don't believe Romans 8, 28. All things work to the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I said, Lord, I believe that. He said, then why don't your mouth reflect it? You ask me how I'm doing, I'll say fabulous. Why? Because of Romans 8, 28. That's right. Now, I, I like to add a little humor where I can. People ask me, how you doing? I say, a lot better than I look. Romans 8, 28. God's hand is on my life, and his hand is on your life. 
Now, there's three things that you need to do. Number one, I need to do what I can do. See, faith is an action word. There are certain things that we can do. We need to simply do it. If it's in our power to do it, get up in the morning, go to work, etc. Number two, give God what I can't do. There are certain things that are outside of our specter of control. You know how that works. Give it to God. Number three, trust God no matter what. Trust is the essence of faith. You're trusting the hand of God. Acknowledge God's love for you. Confess God's love for you. And what's going to happen when you do that? You're going to win the war in your mind. And you're going to be able to rise up to who God's called you to be. I'd like to ask everybody if you could close your eyes right where you're at. Just close your eyes. The Spirit of God has been speaking today. What have you heard the Spirit say to you? What is it that the Holy Spirit has been nudging in your heart? You may be here and you might say, Well, Pastor Charles, truth be known, I'm not serving God. But I need to be and I want to. Well, let me tell you something that can change right here this morning. Scripture teaches us that God listens to the sincere heart. And if you'll call out to God from humility and sincerity, He'll answer you. All you've got to say is, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and make me new. And Lord, I want to serve you the rest of my life. I want my life to glorify you from this moment on. I surrender myself to you, to your keeping. If you'll do that right now, Scripture tells us that you'll become born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, right there where you're at. Father, you're so good to us. God, we, we, we're just amazed at the amount of love you have. We're amazed at the mercy you show toward us. God, we're amazed at your hand of kindness. We don't understand it, but we, we just we want to say thank you. And oh God, in the days and weeks ahead, help us to walk this out, that we might indeed win the war in our mind, that our lives, oh God, might redound to your glory. We love you, Father. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Pastor David. Let's give it up for Pastor Charles this morning. Thank you for that word today. Awesome. Cool deal. Hey, quick, three quick things before we get out of here. The first thing is, if you made a decision to put your faith in Christ today, I want to invite you to look in the back of the chair in front of you, and you will see an I have decided card. And we want to invite you to take that card, fill it out real quick, and take it to our next steps table by the front door. We'll have someone there. And we want to give you a gift and help you get started and plugged into this new life of faith. Amen? If everyone could stand. If our prayer team could come up to the front. We believe in the power of prayer. You know what? We have seen the miraculous hand of God moving in this church. And so we want to invite you, if you need that touch of God, that hand of God to move in whatever it is you need him to move in. We want to invite you to, as soon as we dismiss, come up to the front and receive prayer. But last but not least, we have a free after party in the cafe out here in the lobby. We want to invite you. Don't be in a rush. Meet someone you haven't met before. But with that being said, thanks for being here. You are now dismissed.